Hey guys, just a quick note before we begin that the show may contain spoilers and adult language, but that's just because we know how to have a good time. Stick around, you'll be glad you did. You are here for me to enlighten you. If you ever act like this again, you're barred for life. It's just vile and base. It's kind of embarrassing. If you know your lines, then you can forget them. Oh, I get it. It's very clever. <laughs> Hello, peoples, and welcome to Esoterica Cinema, the podcast where we take films from the cinematic multiverse and discuss the hell out of them. My name is Jason Peters, and with me, as always, is the man who currently has a warrant out for his arrest in the state of West Virginia, Mr. Ryan Seabold! What's up, Jason? How's it going, buddy? Not bad, man. Not bad. So, uh, yeah, inquiring minds want to know, dude, uh, what's the warrant for? Uh, you know, I'm just a big John Denver fan and, uh, country roads take me home, West Virginia. And I went over there and I got into a little trouble. Um, they didn't like my kind up there very much. I'm not, uh, not exactly certain why I have a strange notion. Steve, the monkey is behind this. Um, <laughs> making another appearance from know, last week. Steve, the monkey, this is going to turn yeah. into like a long running family guy bit, isn't it? Well, you know, uh, he, uh, I don't know if you know this, but he's from the Appalachians. He's an Appalachian chimpanzee, uh, which are more common than you'd think. Uh, <laughs> I was not aware of that. It doesn't yeah. seem like a climate well suited to primates, but hey, here we are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, they're just rife with chimps up there. Uh, you wouldn't expect that. So he's from up there. Uh, I went up there on vacation, uh, do a little hiking, go enjoy the mountains. You know, Burt Reynolds out, uh, or more like Ned Beatty in the shape I'm in. But uh, yeah, uh, he did not appreciate me crossing the lines, the uh, the Mason Dixon line, as you uh, as it were. And uh, he had some things to say. He rousted up a posse, uh, and they came at me pretty hot and heavy. <laughs> now, so ladies and gentlemen, I, I listening. Okay, is, hold on, hold on. We need to not we need, legitimate. We, we need we need to get right at this, dude. Th- this whole thing right now is bullshit, okay? Because I happen to have <laughs> the public <laughs> records sure. on hand that say that Ryan, you exposed yourself at a diner. Well, look, the monkey wasn't wearing pants. I thought it was okay. Now like Steve-, Steve was in there at the bar, completely naked. I mean, he's a monkey. <laughs> but now here's the thing: I know you. I mean, you're a pretty modest fellow, and so I I was just kind of you know figured that there was probably some sort of you know, a wrinkle to the story. It was maybe just a misunderstanding because, again, I, I know you like you don't even you don't even you'll only wear two swimming trunks at once when you go to a public pool. So all of a sudden it's like Ryan whipped his shit out at a diner. That that doesn't sound right. It, it actually is true. I, uh, oh, wow. I expose myself in a diner. I know oh, wow. it, it's OK. I. I it is what All it right. is. Hey, but- new shades, bro. Honestly, I mean, I've been telling you, I've been telling you forever to expand your horizons, and I didn't know this is where it was going to take you. But, bro, uh, you know, rock your freak flag. Uh, I'm not here to Buck judge. Naked in a Waffle House. Maybe That's, next. Uh- <laughs> maybe next time, just do it somewhere where there's no CCTV. You know? Yeah. Uh, those videos got it. The internet. I mean- I'm a little embarrassed. Um, you know. Although, you know, I did see the footage, and hey, you know. You're you're bringing it where it counts, buddy. I always suspected as much, and uh, the confirmation is there. So a lot of impressed females in that diner, ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you. Can't have eggs without the sausage, Jason. You can't have <laughs> eggs without the sausage in a Waffle House. Uh, yeah, and Steve was in the foreground, by the way. I don't know if anybody noticed that. No pants on that monkey. Uh, so whatever, man. I just uh, I got to stay out of West Virginia, which no harm, no foul. Yeah, we didn't. We don't need to go there, anyways. And you know what? You can do this podcast from anywhere in the country, so uh, we're good, buddy. And on that note, I believe you have a description of the movie we're going to look at today, don't you? I do. This is Tucker and Dale versus Evil from 2010, uh, directed by Eli Craig. Uh, which, upon doing a little research, I found out is Sally Field's son uh, of all really? people. So, wow. uh, yeah. IMDb has this listed as two lovable hillbillies are headed to their fixer upper vacation cabin. Hey, like me in West Virginia uh, to drink some (laughs) beer, do some fishing and have a good time. Keep those pants on, kids. Uh, But when they run into a group of preppy college kids who assume from their looks that they must be inbred chainsaw wielding killers, Tucker and Dale's vacation becomes a bloody and hilarious uh, romp for the worse. Jason, 
What'd you think about this movie, buddy? I'll be happy to let you know right after we listen to this trailer for Tucker and Dale vs. Evil. Oh, jeez. Whoa, Jesus. Did you see the way those guys looked at us? Who wants to go skinny dipping? We got your friend! The ambulance! They captured Allison! Oh, oh, oh! It's the pancakes! You hate pancakes! I'm, I'm gonna make you something else! What am I doing here? Fell into the water. I uh, dove in and rescued you. We'll go find your friends. You should relax. Tucker and Dale are on the case. What is this place? It's just a cabin. It doesn't mean they're psycho killers. Then why don't you go in there and talk to them? All right. Maybe I will. I said maybe. Dale, what are you doing? I'm, I'm digging a crapper hole. You mind if I help? He's making her dig her own grave. There's no rules out here. It's us against them. No! Oh, good look, your friends are here. Are you okay? Saw your friend out there. He must be allergic to bees or something because he was running like a bat out of hell. This is a suicide pact. These kids are coming out here and they're killing themselves all over the woods. Oh my God, that makes so much sense. Oh, get up, get up, get up, get up, get up, get up. The girl that we have, she can maybe explain the whole thing. You've got another one inside. Oh, she's in my bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you gotta take the safety off on the side there. Don't do that. Ah! Time to start being more careful. Get up, get up, get up, get up. Time to die, freak. Come on. Come on. Fire. Stop, stop the rope. No, don't, don't use that. <laughs> Let's get you down from there. Wait. Sorry about that. This vacation sucks. All right, Ryan. I got to tell you, man, I really did not like this movie. Really did not like this movie. So disappointed. People have been telling me for years to watch this damn movie, and I've always been looking forward to it. I like Alan Tudyk. I like the other guy who's been on, like, 18 failed Fox sitcoms, uh, the Large Dale <laughs> Gentleman. And, you know, like, the, the, the conceit, the setup, everything... I really expected to enjoy this movie so much more than I did. Right. What was your reaction? What'd you think? No, same. I really, uh, yeah. So a couple things okay. real quick. Let me, let me preface this whole episode by saying, uh, <laughs> I want to walk back, uh, what you said last time, wherein uh, I do remember seeing this when it first came out. I do not ever re remember recommending this to you. So if I did, I am so sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm very, very apologetic to you or anybody in my path who I told to watch this. Uh, this movie made me mad. Uh, it I made was, me mad too. I'm so I happy physically you angry. said that. I, I yes. got so angry twice at the film. We'll go into right. that later. But for so, so many reasons, said, I was mad. <laughs> so funny you said that, dude. So many reasons. Oh man. Okay. So let's go ahead and let's set. Let's go ahead and let's get started here. We're gonna set yeah, this yeah. up with our opening shot, like we do now. Okay. So the film opens with a POV shot from a handheld, it's at the beginning, black and white shaky cam. Now time, ca <laughs> now, time code runs across the bottom with a battery meter visible at the top right. We've got an attractive woman somewhere in her 30s, and she speaks to the camera operator, which is in turn us, admonishing the suggestion that they turn back from the house they're in. Now, they're exploring what seems to be a haunted cabin in the name of, quote, investigative journalism, but within moments... She is clubbed in the head by a bloody stranger who leaps out from behind a closed door. Now, the cameraman turns, and in turn the POV does as well, runs away, but quickly finds a similar fate. The camera drops to the ground, as does the body of the cameraman before us, and we cut to our title card for Tucker and Dale versus Evil. Now, Ryan, the one thing that I will say about that opening shot is that it reminded me tremendously of Blair Witch. Like, just yeah, I think jacked that's what they were going for, right? right off. <laughs> jacked right off. 
<laughs> That's not what I meant to say. I just heard it right now. They totally I'm not just... cutting that, by the way. I'm not cutting uh, that. That's you know, That's gold, dude. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, no, they totally jacked that from Now Blair who has Witch, a warrant like, out shot... for their arrest in West Virginia? <laughs> it's on the brain now. I just can't get it off my mind. The image of you naked so. in a Waffle House. Um, but yeah, no, so totally ripped off from Blair Witch. And uh, the story then from there begins... Three days prior, for some reason, I'm not exactly sure why they felt like they had to to backpedal this. It's not like that ends up really coming into play by the end of it or anything. No. Uh, at least I didn't think it did, and maybe there was something I missed. But either way, yeah. In so fact, it's, it's my understanding that we never get to that part of the situation at all. They I guess because never, never three that. days don't pass, right? Uh, they never. Yeah, it, it shows us that it would only be like one or two. Uh, yeah. Well, I guess <laughs> it was such a weird preface. And again, why did you? Why backpedal that? Like, it's just there. There was no reason to do that. It's so weird. And that's the only reason I could think of uh, is to set the tone, like to start with something suspenseful and then unwind it to something. No, I understand why that's done in many horror films. I understand why that scene exists, but just play it through again. We're harping on a very small decision, but you're going to see it's like there's a number of these small decisions over the course of the film that are just kind of maddening because you're like, why? Why? It doesn't make sense. Why would you do this? And why would you subject me to it in turn? So if it seems like we're harping on technicalities, it's probably because we're doing that thing where we're upset with the film like we discussed and so these things are going to come across you know more critically than they would otherwise right so yeah well and i I just want to preface this whole episode too by also saying uh that i wanted to like this movie and one of the things i'm mad about is that it's hard for me to really dissect why i didn't like this film um everything that i bitched about the endless and the void uh, and even dead alive or, or under the skin, all these things that we talked about, this is like a good middle of the rotor, uh, of all those things, pros and cons. I should have liked this movie and I didn't. And I'm, I'm sure we're going to get to why, as you start to bring up some of these points, like you just did, uh, you're absolutely right about the opening sequence, but I, sh- I should have liked this movie. I wanted to like this movie. Uh, and yet here we are. <laughs> Me apologizing for ever putting this on the list. Absolutely. So when the film begins in again proper, the story proper, we've got these kids and they're frat and sorority kids. They're on a road trip. They're you know driving through the Appalachian Mountains, and then we see these two creepy looking hillbillies that pass in a truck. Now, in any other movie, that would be the antagonists, the people that are going to attack the kids. But in this movie. That's actually our main characters, the lovable Dale and his friend Tucker. That's right. They're mistaken for hillbillies, but they're really nice guys. Coming up, you at 11. <laughs> it's a very sort of sitcom you know, setup that honestly could work. I mean, I, you know, uh, so let me let me just ask you about this. So, Ryan, what did you th- what do you think about just that? idea and conceit the setup as a whole where it's like hey we're gonna do this thing where you know these kids think these two people are serial killers but they're actually nice guys and it's a series right. of misunderstandings what what do i think about that premise i think it's yeah. great i think that's great I, yeah. I loved it uh that's again uh, i can't stress this enough i should have liked this movie uh, i wanted to like this movie i love the premise Uh, my take on this whole film is that it's strongest when it leans on its premise, but it's kind of a one trick pony. Like there's not really anything else going on. So when we stray away from the premise itself with the, uh, kids versus the, um, hillbillies, and we'll get into more of this as we go along. But if you're asking me directly about the premise, I think that the premise is strong. I just don't think there's anything else going on. And when we stray from the premise, that's when the movie just really falls short and I get bored. Yeah, absolutely. No, I, I, I agree 100%. I have the same exact assessment. It's a film that should have worked. Um, it's a strong premise. It's definitely one of those high concepts they talk about, right? Like you can kind of sell the film just on, on that setup. But ultimately, you delivered something that wasn't what people were hoping for. So from there, Ryan, the kids realize that they forgot to get beer. So they're going to go to a local convenience store and they run into Tucker and Dale again. And they're given some creepy looks. But immediately we go and switch from the kids POV to Tucker and Dale's POV. And then we get to hear them talk and engage with one another. And we find out they're like, ah, they're actually, you know, some pretty nice guys. And Dale's, you know, the lovable loser sort. And uh, apparently Tucker's like the charming talker guy. 
But there's some really attractive uh, young girls with these kids from the sorority. Uh, the main one who actually is, uh, I forget her character's name, but she's the attractive secretary from 30 Rock. And that's the Absolutely. only other thing I've ever seen her in. I've, I've never seen her in anything else. Is it Siri or something like that? Siri, like yeah, that. yeah, yeah, something like that. But yeah, anyway, so yeah, she's in it. Of course, you know, lovely looking girl. And Dale's naturally attracted to her. Goes over to talk to her. And he does so when he's like holding this scythe and he's very awkward. And, you know, it's a it, and it's just, a, again, a misunderstanding where they're sort of afraid of him and think that he's trying to intimidate them when really he's just an awkward kind of guy. So and again, yeah, I agree with you, Ryan. It's a strong setup from there. Tucker and Dale head up to this cabin They've got some PBRs popped in the truck, but they're pulled over by this cop who basically gives them the like pet cemetery, like, ah, you're going there. Nah, you don't want to go down there. Right. Like literally <laughs> tells them there's like, there's nothing but death and destruction and dismay over there. And it's like, that's a little strong. Um, but they end up uh, arriving at their vacation house soon. Ryan, by the way, that was the evil dead house, right? Don't know. Totally looked like the evil dead house. And I know. Like, I don't know who owns that property. I don't know if, like, Sam Raimi's since gone back and bought it. But, like, I believe they used that house in Stranger Things or the cabin in Stranger Things. I believe okay. they used the cabin here. I'm pretty sure that cabin's got a lot of I don't think it is. Play. I, I really don't. Because they really? shot this in Canada up in uh, British Columbia, I believe. Oh, and, really? Uh, I think oh, shit. It looks exactly like it. Evil Dead like was it. shot in Michigan uh, where Sam or Raimi Or, like, Tennessee Cohen's or some shit like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's up? Yeah, I thought it was, like, in Tennessee or something, the house. but Or North Carolina or something like that. But, yeah, it could totally be Michigan, too. Maybe. Eh, yeah, either way. Uh, yeah, no, either way. Well, if it's not the house, it looks very, very similar. Let's uh, at least say that. But anyway, so, and it's a, you know, fixer-upper, creepy, dusty, but it's got good bones, as the realtors like to say. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> there's good a bunch of- Good bones indeed. <laughs> and there's a bunch of, uh, you know, there's a bunch of creepy, dusty shit all over the place. And then there's also these sort of news clippings on the wall. And they make mention of this sort of Memorial Day massacre thing that happened- uh, and I did think it was funny that the one thing Dale notices is an advertisement for a chili dog place that has like a two for one special going on. Uh, I thought there was, you know, a couple little moments like that peppered throughout that I didn't completely hate. Whereas like, oh, that's kind of cute or oh, it's a little funny or like it got a little chuckle. Um, but it was largely like those like the small moments that resonated and there wasn't a lot of them. Whereas, like, all of the large moments really just kind of fell flat, and we'll get into why over the course of that. Um, but I did think that was interesting. There was kind of a, some little things here and there that did work for me that kept it from being, like, a 100% failure, but not enough to make up for it, you know, as a whole. Yeah. Now, from there, you know, we see the kids. They're in the woods, and they end up doing a retelling of this Memorial Day massacre where, at the time, the the college kids... They were killed by these two crazy hillbillies, and of course that's going to set up the fact that, you know, the kids mistake Tucker and Dale for those two same hillbillies. And later that night, they're going skinny dipping, and Allison doesn't want to go, but then she, like, goes by herself. Allison's the, the, the girl we just spoke of from 30 Rock, and Tucker and Dale are actually out on a boat. They're fishing, they're drinking, and, you know, they watch Allison strip down to her underwear, of course. And Dale is actually covering his face. You know, he's he's not going to do it. But Tucker's trying to watch. And then Dale, I think, ends up saying, like, Tucker, like, da, 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 like, yells out or something like that. Gets her attention. She notices, slips, falls, crashes into the water. And then they go to basically, like, sort of save her and be and, and try to get her friends to pick her up. But because yeah, she the hits friends, her head on a rock or something like that. Yeah. Unconscious. But because the friends have already decided that they're these like psycho killers, as they do throughout the course of the film, they misinterpret what their yeah, they intent is. The, these hillbillies, you know, struggling to get her lifeless body into a boat, basically yeah. half naked. And, uh, and then they, he ends up calling you know, out. To it's him, easy to yeah. see the other side. And so, they're, you know, go back and forth showing how these two misunderstood hillbillies could, you know, easily be. In any other film, you know, totally an antagonist. But in this particular film, they're just misunderstood simpletons. And yeah, uh, they're just trying to enjoy their vacation. And really, ultimately, we're in the wrong place at the wrong time uh, where these college kids now are set up to get vengeance and get their friend back. So it's these two groups that are now pitted against each other uh, because of this one event. Yes. So, and I do have a clip of that that I'm going to play real quick. What's the matter with you? Me? What did I do? When you see a college girl prancing around in front of you half naked, you do not yell out my name. Well, you were being a peeping Tom. You were hopeless. Do you know that? You're hopeless. 
She didn't come up yet. Oh, Jesus. Hey! Lady! Hey, lady! Where'd you go, Chuck? Oh, 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 oh. hell! And so again, the film does sort of play that effectively in the moment, you know, where he's like, hey, kids, I got your friends, da da da. But and so you can see both sides like you're talking about. But I mean, that's that's the entire movie. Like, that's the right. trick it has. It's just yep. a series of like, oh, here's something that could be misinterpreted. Oh, here's something that could be misinterpreted. And I, you know, I don't know. I don't know what it is that keeps the jokes from like working over the course of the film. Um, I can, don't either. Dissect that a little bit, but it, yeah, it just got really tired. And I think, well, Ryan, I think a large part of it is really, you know, one of the things we talked about at the the first episode of the season, Dead Alive, was how imaginative it was, right, with regards to like yes. the deaths and the mayhem. And this movie was kind of content to just like throw people on sticks over and over again. Like yeah. half the kids just get impaled, whether always of their own device. Right. Um, the, you know, the one kid that ends up, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. So let me ask you first though, before we continue here, Ryan, um, one of the things that stuck out to me was, was the cinematography and the overall look of this film. And before I give you my opinion, I just wanted to know what yours was. Specifically, I, I thought it was fine. Yeah. Um. I looked up the DP. He shot a couple of Ernest movies. Like he, <laughs> this guy shot a fuck ton of shit. His credits are like long and distinguished, uh, as they say. But uh, yeah, it's a lot of B stuff. It's a lot of uh, TV movies or TV series stuff. Um. And then there's some schlocky stuff that he filmed. Uh. Be you know some some movies along the way. Nothing too crazy uh but he has shot a lot of stuff i thought the the cinematography was okay i didn't hate it D uh, did you yeah honestly i thought this film looked like hot garbage man like i really was, i i felt like they uploaded the log footage without any sort of color correction and that's that's like everything was flat everything was muddied everything felt gray the only thing i could think about was that they tried to shoot it in this way to reflect the horror movie aspect of it right instead of shooting it bright like a comedy they tried to shoot it stark and shadowy and okay like a horror film but it did not work for me at all i thought everything just looked like trash to be completely honest like i the, oh, it, wow. like to the point that it really bothered me to the point that i was uh, again like was one of several things that upset me about it so i mean having watched the Endless and The Void back to back. And now this, I thought this was the better of the three cinematography oh, wise. Really? Oh, man, I I completely disagree. I thought this was by f I thought this was inferior to The Void, even let alone The Endless. I thought The Endless looked wow. really good. Yeah, no, I thought this film looked like trash. All right. <laughs> Sorry, it's there. gonna be flat out. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. so uh, no, I mean, that's what I go going back to what I was saying before. That's why I'm so mad is that I can't really wrap my head around why I don't like this film. I didn't mind the cinematography. I didn't mind the music. Tyler Labine and Alan Tudyk are fantastic. I loved the, their hillbilly performances, Dale and Tucker, uh, respectively. Uh, I thought they were charming. They were likable. Um, they played their roles pretty well. Um, Katrina Bowden served her purpose. Like I thought that she didn't over dumb it down, which she could have gone full Paris Hilton, but she uh, gave that character of Allison some level of heart uh, where it was believable that she would sympathize with our Dale character, uh, which we'll get to here next, I'm assuming. But um, because now Dale and Tucker have her, uh, they're trying to bring her back to health from her concussion of sorts after she conked her head uh, and they're harboring her. But uh yeah, I, I I liked most of these aspects of the film, and especially in contrast to The Void and, and The Endless. Everything that I said, oh, I wish this would have been this, or I wish this would have been that. It just wasn't, uh, the best I could tell is, number one, it wasn't funny. There wasn't any jokes. Yeah. Like, it was funny when it leaned on its premise. But even but when you do that, by an hour and a half in, you're way over that. Like, the premise is, you, you got to have more than that. And, and this just really didn't. Yeah, so, or you've got to, at least like we've talked about before, you've got to be willing to, like, up those stakes, right? Like, that's what right. we talked about 
you know, Dead Alive and other films Whether did it's so the well. Kills or like, I hate going back to Dead Alive yeah. over and over, but it was just, it did what we're talking about so perfectly and it just keeps coming up. But like, yeah, just constantly elevating the stakes, constantly motivating, you know, where everything sets up and begets the action that follows, right? We went on that whole thing about, you know, yeah. the scene with the baby and everything in the house. And so, yeah. So, I mean, again, and this more felt like what you were talking about with The Void last week where it's like, it's constantly just sort of bringing things in when it's convenient. Like you said, kind of like a, a, a young child telling a story where they don't properly set everything up. Right. And it's right. like, oh, yeah, there's a bunch of kids there. And then, um, oh, yeah. And then uh, Tucker has a wood chipper now. Uh, he got a wood chipper. Yeah. Yeah. No, he got it earlier. Um, we yeah. He just he lets us know that he got that <laughs> earlier. And uh, and then, you know, the kid, instead of doing something, you know, reasonable to attack him, he 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 uh, karate flies himself at Tucker. And when he dodges, like goes flying into the wood chipper. And it's like, I mean, again, I know we're not in the realm of, of realism by any stretch here. But like, uh, why does that, why does, why does that kid dive headfirst at Tucker when there's a fucking wood chipper right there, dude? Like, right. I well, mean, there's it, no it, reason like, because, and the thing is it's lazy writing. That's exactly what it is. It's like, how can we get the kid in the wood chipper? And they sat there and they thought about it and they mulled it over for days. And the best they could come up with is, ah, oh, what if the guy goes to attack him by dying? Diving head first from three feet away. No, that's a bad decision. That's that's not good writing. And and this film repeatedly does shit like that. It's lazy. Yeah, and it sets it. I mean, like, there's so many winks, and like you see this shit coming, like a Bugs Bunny cartoon. Like you know, yeah, he's going totally. in that wood chipper. You see the wood chipper, and you're like, like, ah, which kid is gonna end up in that? <laughs> yes, exactly. Which is fine. They're not just gonna. It's not yeah. necessarily a bad thing, but when it's it's just done again, it's so lazy and clunky about the way it sets all this shit up. Well, there's that. There's the jokes don't land. There's you know the predictability of the the premise, and so, and so much is that's all it really has to lean on. So it repeats itself. There's like a hundred sm very small things that all stack up to me hating this movie because it actually could have been good. I like Tyler Labine and Alan Tudyk's performances. I like the concept. Uh, I think given a better uh, writer and director this whole premise and this whole acting squad could have been a lot better i, I had a lot of problems that. with this film in a lot of the same ways that i had problems with willie's wonderland where it was neither this nor that remember when i was saying like it wasn't funny enough like this movie isn't funny enough to be a comedy it's not scary enough to be a horror it's not charming enough to be evil dead or or one of those you know genre films um or even cabin in the woods remember cabin in the woods uh, i do with, yeah uh, no it's, it suffers from uh, this? it suffers from my classic uh brookie syndrome that i've talked about before uh, for for those listening, my my Brookie syndrome is where so I am of the opinion that uh, Brookie, which is half brownie and half cookie, uh, is is an inferior version of both. Right. Uh, so right. often in life, when you try to have it all, the only way that you get it is by is, is by getting lesser versions of each of those things. Right. So instead of getting a brilliant brownie or a brilliant cookie, you try to have both, and then you get mediocre brownie cookie experience. Right. Whereas if you would just settled in and been like and committed Committed, sacked up, made a decision, be like, this is what I'm having, and I'm getting the best version of that. But no, you try to have it all, and then it all suffers. Can't get it all. Can't turn go. a hoe into a housewife, Jason. Can't turn <laughs> a hoe into a housewife. Biggie taught us that. <laughs> <laughs> he also um, taught us never to get high on your own supply and other such gems in 12 Crack Commandments. Yeah, and I've adhered Spotify to that. I near you. Please. I have adhered to that my entire life, and it's brought me nothing but success. <laughs> <laughs> Now, the one thing I will say, Ryan, about that I do sort of enjoy about the film is um, I did really like Allison and Dale's sort of relationship, right? It's kind of right. – it's what the kids would call a, a, meet, a meet cute these days, I believe. Well, that's what I was saying. Katrina Bowden, who plays Allison, brought a level of heart to this character. I really enjoyed her character. Yeah, yeah, you know, and, and, you know, even though it's entirely unrealistic, you know, and you kind of know that, like, by the end they're going to fall in love and blah, blah, blah and all this sort of stuff, like – um, the, the, the performances were charming. I think, you know, it's, it's interesting because when I'm thinking more about it right now, the performances, so I came away with like thinking 
having sort of like a mediocre response to Tucker and Dale and Allison. I didn't, I didn't hate them. I didn't love them. Right. But the more I'm thinking about it now, I really don't think it was a matter of performance so much as it was just the dialogue uh, that they were given. Right. Because, and the way that everything was just sort of forced in there, it's like, Oh yeah, by the way, I want to be a therapist because, you know, halfway through the script, they're like, oh, right, we're doing that thing at the end where she's going to mediate. So let's make sure that we drop a line there. But it's it's, <laughs> but it's, it's, yeah, it's just so lazy and just thrown in there, you know, ham fisted, as we like to say. Um, and it's a series of like, oh, right, we're doing this. Let's make sure that we explain that in three to five words here. And it's like, dude. That's 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 really not enough. You know, you got to give these things a little more attention. And even no, though I mean, given a, a more capable writer, I think that this would have been a lot better. The dialogue, the jokes, everything that we were like with either the college students or Dale and Tucker exclusively um, just would deflate uh, very quickly because they were left to their own devices of just talking to each other and giving, you know, dialogue, the, the, the dialogue or uh, the exposition or the humor all would fall flat. But then when we got back to college students versus Dale and Tucker, the premise would carry it along. But like you said, the deaths never escalated. Nothing the stakes never ramped up really. Um, going back to my comparison to cabin in the woods. That's why that movie worked for me is every act of that film got more and more ape shit bananas. We found out they were being spied on. Then we found out they're being like, they're in a cage of sorts. Uh, and the whole thing is a setup. Then we find out it's a sacrifice to the gods and like that whole thing in the <laughs> basement of the earth. And like the, the apocalypse is coming and some demon is uh, being hard. Like it just kept. And to the yeah. point where, Spoiler alert, someone fucking crashes the cat like a God thing come and crashes the cabin at the end, uh, like in the end of Bambi and versus Godzilla. And I fucking love that movie. But th- this had none of that. Once you got over the initial premise and got over the hump of what this movie was, it was just like, all right, uh, another one and another one. And the, like you said, the deaths were the same. Everything was kind of just like got really lazy. But yeah. if it makes you feel any better. Uh, our director and writer, Eli Craig, was never heard from again. So, <laughs> <laughs> Can't imagine why. Can't imagine why. Yeah. Now, the, now, yeah. now and so, and this is what I mean by lazy, because, like, the first kind of, the first couple times they do these things, they do work. So, like, you know, right after we sort of get the Allison and Dale set up, there's the scene where Tucker's outside and he's working with the chainsaw and he accidentally cuts into a beehive and then all the bees go crazy so you know he's running through the forest you know waving his chainsaw around but really it's just like he you know he's got a bunch of bees and you know the kids are around and they end up running away with them and then there's the one kid who's sort of keeping pace with them looks over and then all of a sudden gets like stabbed through the chest with this branch that's like sticking out right from the ground and so that was the first time they did that and it was actually very effective but then they would do it like four or five more times without exaggeration and it was just like guys again like i i know that you know impaling is one of the cheap deaths you know you have the actor stick the uh the old stick there underneath his armpit and uh go ah you know and st- so it's like it's it's a cheap effective way that you can do a death scene but again I don't need to see that three or four times. Yeah, dude. and just a foreshadowing for the deaths too. Like you'd see them coming a mile away. Nothing caught you off guard. There was no surprise. There was no ramping up uh to your point, but also uh they would show you the wood chipper. They showed you that loose beam uh that ended up bringing a, a Oh yeah, with the cop. plank down from the ceiling that that stabs the cop in the face yeah. uh, or impales the cop in the face with a bunch of loose nails for some reason. Uh but uh they showed you that beam around this point in the film uh when Allison is leaning back in her chair uh and Dale is like don't do that. That beam is loose. And it's like, okay, well, we automatically know something's going to happen with yeah. that. And then when you see the cop standing next to it about ready to lean against it, you're like Okay, here we go. And sure enough, it, it's exactly what you expect. It's a, it's textbook, uh, and it gives you what it's set up to the T without any twist or surprise or ramping up or anything. So when it does happen, it's just deflated, and you're like, yeah, I knew that was going to happen at some point. I mean, am I... Am I off base on this? No, no, no. You're absolutely right. And uh, yeah, actually, I do have a scene of that that I'm going to go ahead and play. It's like right before that moment happens where Tucker and Dale are basically hauling the lower torso of the kid that jumped into the wood chipper away when the cop shows up. So let's go ahead and listen to that real quick. Hi. Hello, officer. Good to see you again. Yeah. We have had a doozy of a day. A real doozy. Uh... 
there we were. Yep. <laughs> uh, minding our own business. Yep. Making some improvements to my new house. The new house? When all of a sudden, out of nowhere, these kids <sighs> started killing themselves all over my property. Yeah, this one right here, he dove head first right into the wood chipper. In the woody right back there. There's another one up over there who, who shoved a spear through his gullet. Straight through. Now, I don't know how much experience you've had with this, but we were scared shitless. Scared shitless. I... You must think that I'm some kind of moron to believe a story like that. No. Oh, no. No, sir. Not a moron. Not... Just open-minded. Let me get this straight, because I'm having trouble understanding something. What? You say you were just working when this kid ran up and stuffed his head into that wood chipper? That's a fact. That's a fact. And, and I think maybe they might be trying to kill the girl that we have inside. What girl? You know what? She can maybe explain the whole thing. If, 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 uh, if I hadn't knocked her unconscious with a shovel <laughs> on accident. On accident. Now, Ryan, this is actually a good scene to to discuss here real quick, because I think that this is sort of like emblematic of the issues that I had with this movie, which is that like it has such potential for these very funny comedic exchanges and it just doesn't hit the mark. So like, you know, the moment where they're dragging the, the, the legs and it's all bloodied and the cop shows up and he's like, what's going on there? And there's that, you know dramatic slash comedic pause and you're waiting to hear what they're going to say. And he's like, oh, we have had a doozy of a day. And it's like, man, I, you know, I, I don't know what the one liner is there that, but that is, that should have been a very funny moment, right? Just given everything at play there. And for whatever reason, the words that they strung together, the way it's played, be, be, be it the performance, be it the way it was shot, it just doesn't work. It didn't make me laugh. And, and, and again, to your point earlier, we talked about it at the beginning of the show. Like, these are moments that should work. And I can't really wrap my head around exactly why they didn't, other than just to say, like, here's a bunch of examples of shit that didn't work. Yeah, I, I think I was just bored by this point. Um, I was kind of checked out. And so that, again, kind of like The Void, where when it starts to really give us something at the end... Uh, I was just kind of like, uh, whatever. Uh, and so that line is a, a funny line to me, uh, in, you know, out of context, but in the context of this film, when it gets delivered and how bored I was at the time and how taken out of the film I was. Yeah. It just kind of fell flat. This movie wanted to be Shaun of the dead. This was hillbilly West Virginia, Shaun of the dead to me in a way, yeah. just but with a different premise, but in the context of these two, uh, you know, unlikely heroes of sorts in Dale and Tucker that are put in a situation uh, that they shouldn't be in and, and, you know, have to charm their way out. And so you've got, you know, Simon, Hillbilly, Simon Pegg and Nick Frost, more or less. Right. Um, and Tyler Labine and Alan Tudyk. And they just don't really have the charisma. And it's not Edgar Wright. Let's be honest. Eli Craig yeah, is, doesn't sure. have the charm <laughs> and the humor and the pacing and the and the music. And all of the things that made that film so fantastic, uh, this just l was lackluster on every single box you go down to check. Yeah, it really, and I think you kind of hit a large part of what doesn't work about it, which is just, it, it doesn't feel like a director that understands comedy, or at mm -hmm. least, you know, in terms of like as a, a visual medium, you know? Uh, because there's not really right. there's not really effective setups and punchlines like 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 I said earlier, it's kind of just like stuff gets dropped here and there at the last minute. And, you know, because I mean, this should be a comedy of errors and it should work. And we've seen so many good examples of that, you know, um, where it's just, you know, I like to me, like I think of like the birdcage or something like that, you know, where it's just still hysterical and it's just a series of misunderstandings or things going wrong. Um, but again, there's a certain way that that's set up and maybe it's the difference between, again, a Mike Nichols and a, would you say his name was Eli Craig? Yeah. Yeah. You know, and maybe it's just that, but again, it's like the, the, the language of comedy is not built into this film as, as it's well, not. as well as, and, and I think a large part of it too is the structuring of the film. Right. And I'm going to give you a perfect example here. Okay. So we're going through this whole thing. So, you know, the, the, the kids went and they got the cop and the cop shows up. 
And and so immediately after that, the cop goes in after the clip we just listened to. Cop goes in. The whole thing we talked about happens where the booby trap goes off. It's not a booby trap. It's like a booby trap, but it's just, uh, you know, something that's wrong with the house or whatever. They didn't plant it there to kill him or anything. Yeah, he, le- he leans on a loose supporting beam and the beam yeah, falls over, which causes a plank to swing down with nails in it and stab him in the fucking face. Yeah, 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 exactly. So immediately after that, the cop, you know, because he's still sort of dazed and he goes out and he gets in the truck with the other kids and they're all screaming. And then the cop ends up dying very shortly thereafter. And then again, just another example of such lazy, lazy writing. The kid who goes out to grab the cop's gun to shoot at Tucker and Dale and the right. the one guy's like, oh, the safety's off. And he's like, what? Huh? Huh? And then shoots himself in the face. Like, come on, dude. Like, that was... Like, you you don't have to be even, like, passably intelligent to not do shit like that, right? And, I, and again, I get that this is, you know, supposed to be like, oh, but, you know, kids in horror movies are always doing stupid shit. But, again, like, if, if you're – there's a difference between leaning on those tropes in the name of laziness or in the name of not being able to figure out where else to go – And then there's, you know, the other side of it, which is sort of like a loving wink and nod. Right. And to your point, that's what Edgar Wright did so well in Shaun of the Dead. Like he absolutely used 100 percent of his creative artistic brain to poke loving fun at this genre. Right. Whereas this movie sort of leaned on those things to say, hey, we can get away with being lazy because the genre allows us to. Well, Shaun of the Dead had so many jokes that worked and it let you know right up front that it was a comedy with the you got red on you and all that, like the foreshadowing yeah. going into that call back. Uh, the timing was better. I mean, Edgar Wright is, if nothing else, a master of timing and pacing. Scott Pilgrim and all his fast, snappy cuts, uh, the way he lands his jokes, um, his comedy timing and all of that uh, set up in punchline uh, foreshadowing plant and payoffs. Uh, Edgar Wright is a, you know, a a masterclass of all these things. And this movie was a failure at all these things, because if it would have had snappy humor um, throughout to help me, you know, stay in the film and carry it along uh, with nice snappy jokes, then honestly, the Bugs Bunny stuff, if you were going to play it out more slapsticky, uh, then, you know, by the time you point, you're pointing a gun at your own face to like look in the barrel to see how a gun works, uh, you kind of have to set that up, right? Like you have to make it a slapstick film in order for me to buy that that would happen. That again, kind of what you were talking about, about setting the rules and breaking your own rules and so forth with the void. Uh, This movie didn't really set up anything. It kind of played out uh, a little more like that's, I just didn't know what this was. I really didn't know what this was. Like it wasn't scary enough to be a horror. There was not enough humor in it to be a comedy. And so you were just left with this scoop of vanilla uh, pudding. And it was just like, meh, you're like, you're again, <laughs> once again, you're left with a brookie, you know, you, you try to get the best of both worlds and instead you get the best of neither world. See, I, I hate that. Cause I love, I love brookies. <laughs> <laughs> of course call, you do. I call them a cookie brownie and I top them with ice cream and it's fantastic. No, so. no, no. They're so inferior, man. You just, you, 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 you got to separate them and you got to have them in their natural element. They weren't meant, meant to be mixed together <laughs> like that. Okay. They bake differently. They bake at different temperatures and shit for different and times. That's fair. <laughs> He's their natural element like uh like west virginian chimpanzees I get <laughs> absolutely it. now let me tell you something so that now now we talked at the beginning of the episode there were there was moments that pissed us off let me tell you right now something that really pissed me off okay so oh boy, here we go so so right after this whole thing with the cop gets in the guy shoots himself the other kid so the main guy, which, by the way, this guy, Chad, we haven't talked about Chad. Chad can go yeah. fuck himself. That guy really is like creepy and rapey and intense. And like, I get that, like, he's supposed to be kind of unlikable, but he is like aggressively unlikable. So here's the thing. So so after the one kid kills himself, Chad ends up grabbing the gun and it's sort of like a little shootout with Tucker and Dale. Right. And then Chad ends up going and grabbing the their dog because Tucker has this one eyed dog that's actually like a bulldog super cute or something like that and this guy Chad grabs the dog holds the dog hostage Tucker says he's gonna go save him so he escapes and he goes and he's he ends up being chased by the kids and he's later caught and he's strung up okay so you know we're kind of feeling like all right you know structure wise 
we're, we should be right about third act, right? Okay, you know, Tucker got kidnapped, and, and now Ted Dale's going to go save him, and that's going to be, you know, more or less our third act wrap-up. Yep. I checked the fucking timeline, and we are at 45 <laughs> minutes. 45 <laughs> minutes of a 90-minute film. We're halfway through this movie. Are you kidding oh me? God. Oh, my right. God. I was so that upset. That is hilarious. So upset. That- I did the exact same thing, dude. I was like, okay, how much longer is this? I know, I knew it was only an hour and a half going yeah. in. So I was like, th- there could only be 20 minutes left. Maybe <laughs> yeah. 10. And uh, we're coming to our grand finale. I paused it real quick because I'm like, I'm going to go, you know, grab a drink, use the restroom, regroup. 45 minutes left. Exactly the same point of view. <laughs> that is fucking hilarious. <laughs> Yeah, so, and and guys, we're th- that's not to say we're going to talk another 45 minutes to wrap up the second half of this film, because no. we certainly do not need to do that, but, like, I mean, I can wrap this shit, up in five minutes. I could not, I was, I was shocked, and not in a good way. Yes. I was absolutely flabbergasted that it had only been two episodes, right? Two television episodes worth of content at this How point. How much more could they have to say? That's what I was thinking. Like, yeah, where are exactly. we going with this? Exactly. So what now, did they set up? That's going to be the big <laughs> reveal that I need to stick around for 45 more fucking minutes of this film. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, we do get the thing where, you know, so Allison wakes back up and she's talking to Dale and Tucker's gone. And that's when Dale sort of explains what's going on with the friends. And she's like, no, 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 that can't be. And then she, she's like, it's got to be some sort of misunderstanding. And then immediately at, she goes out, she gets the note. And we see that, like, they've cut off two of Tucker's fingers and have sent it with the note. And, you know, Allison's trying to figure out what's going on. Now, Dale, I believe... Uh, he's like, you know what? Like, this is crazy. I got to go save Tucker. And that's where he like walks into that trap where he almost gets like a giant stake through the balls, but it, it ends up going like right below and he's able to untie Tucker. And at the same time, we've got the, the few remaining kids that are, they've now gotten to the cabin where Allison is Tucker and Dale's cabin. And they actually like are able to get in and they're like, we're here to save you. And she's like, what's going on? And they're like, Oh, And so, you know, they can't really wrap their heads around it. They assume that the reason Allison is so cool with everything and talking about how, like, Dale and Tucker are really these nice guys is because she has Stockholm Syndrome. And very quickly, we're going to have this thing where Allison is going to moderate a sort of discussion. How long had she been been there? A day? Yeah, two days. She's going to get Stockholm Syndrome in like 24 hours? (laughs) Yeah, and again, I think that's one of those things where it's like, oh, you know, they're they're dumb teenagers, they don't know better, or they're dumb college kids, and it's like, okay, but, you know, no, no, it's, no, dumb it's, it's lazy, exactly, it's lazy writing, and then that's where we, you know, when they have that sort of mediated discussion, uh, where, you know, finally the drop about Allison wanting to be a therapist pay, pay, pays off because she gets to mediate this whole conversation, uh, we learn that, like, Chad has these sort of this crazy grudge because his parents were involved in that Memorial Day massacre that was explained at the top of the film. And apparently his dad was killed, but his mom went crazy. A big reveal. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, You know, Um, and (laughs) something else happens at this point, Ryan, which is that the guy and the girl show up outside, right? The, The two of the remaining kids that haven't died. I completely forgot they existed. I they had do. no idea. <laughs> they showed up when and they I was like, back up, oh like, my oh, God, still that's us. right. Those two kids. I completely oh, yeah. forgot. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And Dude. I think that's a testament to the fact that uh, none of these people really have any memorable moments or enough to do. Everything's so forgettable and repetitive. And it's really only enjoyable in premise alone that by the time I got to this, again, checking the film at 45 minutes, uh, you know, 15, 20 more minutes go by and I am so checked out. Like, I'm like, when I saw 45 minutes, I felt so defeated. Um, I I was so bummed out. I'm like, oh no. (laughs) And, you know, in all fairness too, it doesn't help that I watched, uh, I've watched nothing but these kinds of genre films since the season two started and i'm really hoping we get into something a little different Same, uh, going dude. into the next episode some artsy uh, ass because, terrence malick film just three hours of yeah. nothing but but artsy shots <laughs> give me some pretty shit yeah g- show me someone that could fucking make a movie now granted i i will re- redact and say that uh i really enjoyed dead alive oh hell I really yeah enjoyed dude. under the skin yeah the first I really two, enjoyed the endless. And endless yeah 
It's really just these last couple. But, uh, yeah, but I think that just, you know, I, it was partly very small, partly, but partly due to the fact that I'm kind of just stale on this. And if yeah. it was a good version of this, like if we were watching Shaun of the Dead, I, I would have been back into it. But because I'm watching like a crappy one after I've seen good and bad and uh, the ugly of all these genre kind of films, I was just over it. And, and I was like, wrap it up. Dude, Ryan, just no joke right now, you are 100% describing my reaction to Marvel films. <laughs> I hope now you understand my fatigue with Marvel films, because just sub everything you said with superhero movies, and that describes perfectly why I'm just kind of over the genre right I now. I will but gloves that- off fight you. I will fight club you. <laughs> but I will here's Tyler the thing, dude. you. But to the same degree, like, give me a talented filmmaker so, like, I cannot wait to see Doctor Strange Multiverse of Madness because I can't wait to see what Sam Raimi does with $200 million and interdimensional bullshit, right? Like, I Yeah, but here's the problem with Marvel is you're so fucked because you're not going to know what the fuck is going on having not seen the... The previous I, several films. I'm just films. here for the crazy visuals, dude. I'm just all here right. for Sam Raimi's wonderful visual language. That's right. that's really all I care about. And I didn't see well, the first I think Doctor you're Strange yourself. I yeah, you know, I've 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 gotten to watch a lot of much better films. What I would argue are much better films. Just go ahead and check out my letterboxed. Jason Aberrant, friend me. We'll discuss. But uh, uh, <laughs> real quick, while while we're on the topic, because we're about done with this film and we have some time to fill here. <laughs> um, <laughs> So I, I need to know where where did you leave off in the in the MCU? When did you stop giving a shit? Where did they lose you? Because I'm curious. Like where uh, was it? Like right out the gate where you're like, this has got nothing, no track. Because you are a comic book guy to a yeah. certain degree, and you've liked other comic book adaptations, right? Like I think I think I think the second Ant Man was when I really started feeling fatigued. Like ah, uh, you know, okay. like I, I'm 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 here for the. I would have loved the Edgar Wright version of this, and you know I love the the sub subatomic molecular stuff. But like, once we got out of that, I was kind of like, eh. And then uh, Captain Marvel, uh, once again, I was just kind of like, eh. Fair. And honestly, right. when I knew I was tapped out to this day, <laughs> I fell asleep halfway through Endgame and still haven't oh, wow. gone back and watched it. <laughs> Had you watched Infinity War? <laughs> yes, I, I actually watched Infinity War like. Four or five times. I really liked it. So it was actually sometime between Infinity War and Endgame. Um, Okay. But I'm, but yeah. And then I'm also, uh, I still love Guardians of the Galaxy. So I will absolutely be tuning in for Guardians 3. Uh, Really looking forward to that one. Um, But yeah, just, I mean, so it's, it's, it's kind of going to, it's the way, I guess, honestly, it's the way like probably most people approach DC, right? Where it's like, Okay, you know, like I'm not going to check out all of them, but if a really good one comes out, you know, made by a filmmaker I like, you know, I'll, ch- I'll also check out the next Thor because I'm pretty sure Taika's going to get it again and I love Taika. So um, I will yep. watch some of these films, but I don't feel like I need to keep up with everything. I can just tune in and out as I feel uh, is warranted. I thought Endgame had a good payoff. I do agree with you on uh, there was like a little run there around Captain Marvel where. Um, uh, the movies just got a little bland. Uh, I'm going to do a hot take and say that uh, I don't like Black Panther as much as everybody did. Oh, I did like that one, um, actually. I thought it was really good. It wasn't bad. It wasn't it was bad. Like Scor- I just didn't it was, like I, it. I remember thinking it was like Scorsese's superhero film, which is funny because he would lynch me for saying that. But I was like, dude, there's a lot like there's a lot less like super power shit. And there's a lot more like, you know, guns and car chases and hand to hand combat. And, you know, there's kind of like this you know, underground villains that are trying to steal shit, which sort of has like a mob yeah. feel with Andy Serkis's character. No, that was cool. And I, I really dug it. I, I thought winter soldier did that a little to a little bit better effect. Personally. I love winter soldier. Uh, winter soldier is um, actually my favorite MCU film uh, of, of all of them. Uh, either that, yeah. either that or one of the two guardians, but like, yeah, you will, you will never hear me talk shit about uh, the, the second Good. Captain America. It's, it's, we agree it's on a that, brilliant, brilliant film. I love that. You one really should get into the series stuff. And though. I like, like the Vision was great. Too. For what it's worth, I really liked most of the movies up until I was just done with them. Like every, or every, like every, each one of them needs an origin story and it's always the same goddamn origin story. It's just a little <laughs> bit different. You know, the, uh, now instead of a dead mom, it's a 
dead uncle. You know, instead of being bit by this, you were exposed to that. Like, it's the same exact <laughs> arc. You know, it, it starts the same way. It finishes the same way. Um, and, you know, and honestly, the one thing that Marvel does really poorly is it is and people may disagree with me marvel is really poor at exploring the characters okay any 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 of the personality that we get from all of these different heroes is really because of the performances instead of the writing so all of the characters are written in these very generic fashions as far as i'm concerned and then they get brilliant actors to heighten and make it sound and feel better than it is. But like on paper, like everything's very one note, like, Oh, let's give, you know, Iron Man, the, the one liner and, Oh, let's give Captain America the virtuous. We've got to do this for this reason. And like, it's just, it's just, (laughs) everything is so paint by numbers. It's like this character is this thing. And he will say this thing that is specific to his character. And like, it feels very robotic when I watch those films anymore. All right. I, I mean, <laughs> I digress. I, I really enjoy them for what they are. I think that they, uh, they've they got some serious auteurs uh, that make, you know, that side of the MCU. And yeah. then I think they've got some, uh, you know, just middle of the rotors like Peyton Reed that reigns it back in with Ant-Man. Paul Rudd will be just infinitely fun to watch on camera. Sure. Um, I love Paul Rudd and Michael Douglas and, uh, and all that. So, um, yeah. I, I'm a fan of all of that. I do agree with you with Captain Marvel, uh, but she was set up to be the ultimate badass that she is uh, by the time we get to end game. That's really sad. You fell asleep at the, uh, in the middle. I, I really enjoy the, the back half of end game more than the, the front half is really slow because it's kind of meant as all one film, sure. infinity war and end game. So I think that the middle is kind of your act two, really of a giant saga. So it kind of unwinds, goes to an all, all is lost moment. And then, uh, you know, explodes by the back end, but, uh, and picks up the pace, but, um, Anyway, I I didn't mean to get off on a tangent. I was just curious (laughs) because we never really talked about it. Let's go ahead and wrap (laughs) this one up. So basically we get this moment where, you know, these two other kids that both Ryan and I completely forgot about, completely forgot they existed. They show up, they see that they're having tea there. They assume that there's something weird going on where they're like being held captive. And then Ryan, I wanted to ask you, the guy enters and attacks with a, a, a weapon of sorts. Was that a weed whacker? Was that a weed whacker that he yes. attacked with? What the hell was I that? So. Because weed whackers kind of do trimmer? weed whackers do not do that to people. <laughs> they don't. They don't. They don't uh, liquefy someone's head like in that fashion. So what the hell yeah. was that? I don't know. Unless it was like an edger of, of sorts or some kind yeah, of the whole thing was hillbilly yeah, weed whacker that was, with an that actual was, that blade was very on it. Ridiculous. Yeah, so, but anyway, he enters, no, they're, you know, they're just running out of shit at this point, I think. Exactly. They're like, what can we kill someone else with? What do we got? What do we got? Right. Hey, there's, I found a weed whacker in the shed back here. Fine. Bring it in. Let's go. <laughs> so that guy attacks Tucker. Tucker dodges. He ends up liquefying the girl's face with it. And then, there's you know, so much dodging and a kid right behind someone yes, in this that's film. That's like the that's way pretty much like 90% die. of the kills. Someone dodge, Tucker or Dale dodge. And one of the kids kills the other kid. That's basically yep. every single. That's what I talk about. It's being all lazy momentum writing. based. So I talk about all being momentum lazy based. Writing. Yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, so and then Chad ends up chucking this lamp at the girl, but then it misses and lights the guy on fire. And then the girl it turns, misses. Yeah. Another yeah. dodge. <laughs> and then the girl turns around and is like, oh, hey, this jar of moonshine should put out this fire right quick. Except for, of course, it doesn't because it's fucking a moonshine. So it has the necessary and desired effect of lighting this guy even more so on fire. Uh, after which point the girl's like, ah, I can really go for a smoke right now. And sits down and lights up a cigarette after throwing a bunch of moonshine. And it's like, again, you're really stretching the lines of credibility. She's literally here, laying, like, fuck. laying back on a pile of gas cans that are labeled gas, <laughs> flammable, like total Bugs Bunny shit. This is Elmer Fudd. Uh, to a heartbeat. And, you know, this could have been funny if it was set up as yes. a slapsticky movie and a yeah, comedy Peter film Jackson with someone with comedic uh, chops, you know, to direct this shit. But it wasn't. Yeah. So, you know, needless to say, Tucker, Dale and Allison are able to escape. Chad's actually about to escape. But the girl who got her face somewhat liquefied ends up grabbing his ankle. He stays behind. The house blows up. And, you know, uh, basically Chad, it turns out he didn't actually die. Everyone else died, but Chad survived and he's got the ax and he's going to chase him down. Tucker, Dale and Allison are in the truck. Truck won't start, but then of course it does. But then of course Dale immediately crashes it. 
They all black out. They wake up. Allison's gone, but Tucker has a heart to heart with Dale that we're going to listen to on our third clip right now. Do you remember when we was kids? And we used to go catch frogs down at that creek. Yeah, I, yeah, I guess I do. Remember how we used to compete to see who could catch more? Yeah, well, I don't think now is the time to talk about it, Tucker. And I used to tell you that I let you catch more than me because I felt sorry for you. I remember you used to let me lick them all, too. That always made me feel kind of funny. Yeah. Well, the thing is, I didn't let you catch more. You caught them on your own. You was quicker than I was. Come on, Tucker. It's true. What I'm trying to tell you is that you're better than you think you are. Listen to me. That girl sees it. I've seen the way that the two of you look at each other. I think that she really sees you for who you are. Who knows, maybe after this is all done, you two can uh, uh, date. <laughs> so, I doubt it. Damn it. That's what I'm talking about. I don't want any more negativity. Okay. Stop it. Okay. You are a good man. You're smart. And you're strong. And you're not as ugly as you think you are. Thank you, Tucker. That means a lot coming from you. <sighs> Life is short. Oh, no. You got to go after what you want. Go after her, Dale. She needs you now more than ever. Especially because you're always falling down and hitting her head, knocking herself out. OK, but I, I don't even know where he took her. Jangers now. So Ryan, we finally get to our proper third act. It's now 111, and I'm crawling out of my skin at this point, waiting for this shit to end, <laughs> right? But then, of course, no, we're not going to wrap it up because we're going to get the old timey railroad villain shit. Except instead of the you know the the girl being tied to the railroad tracks, it's the one where they tie her to the log at the log cutting factory, whatever the hell, and then start the you know saw blade up. And now it's that you know short little ticking clock where the log splitter's going down and she's tied there and it's going to cut her in half. And and then we also get one of my 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 less or least favorite tropes of like horror movies, which is when you have a slasher film, a creature film, whatever it is, and then it ends in a fist fight. I hate when they do that, dude. I it's it's not an it's not an action movie. And we we even we didn't like when Willie's did that either. Willie's Wonderland. Right. Um Well, and we're de-escalating because it, you know, it's like you used up all your cool kills in the beginning and then you repeated those kills with the steak shit and now you're just down to fisticuffs. That's and, true. Uh, That's a good point. Yeah, so whereas you know, other greater films that I've enjoyed in this genre, like I said, Cabin in the Woods or Shaun of the Dead have escalated things as they go up in bigger scenes and bigger deaths and more creative kills and uh, all of these things. Uh, but and more humor and comedy and, and you know, not, not the mermaid or whatever it was in Cabin in the Woods. I love fucking love that shit. So, yeah. um yeah, this is, uh you know, deflating and deescalating to the point where we feel the writer's frustration where it's like, I'm out of shit, you know, but I still have 15 minutes to kill and we got to wrap this up. And, uh, it's almost like I'm in the room with that writer thinking that too. And, yeah. uh, and I wish they would have wrapped it up, you know, and killed the guy in the blowed up house. That would have been fine. Uh, I would have been okay with that. Move it on yep. and left it ambiguous. And then you could have cut away to the beginning of the film where the news reporter or some kids or it never really was explained at who had the video camera was in the house. That was, uh, Chuck or Chad or whatever at in that video, right? With the I half believe that's face. supposed to be yeah the insinuation because there's also that like awkward reveal. Or was that where... footage from the original killer? As no, we found I th- out I... that his dad was the actual killer. Yeah, I was gonna say there's that whole clunky reveal where his dad was the killer, and they're like, "Oh, you're half hillbilly," and he's like, "What?" From no, the story that he told at the beginning be. of the film. Yeah. I believe the insinuation is that he is supposed to be the guy from the beginning because he does have half of his face bloodied, the guy at the beginning, the same way that Chad does when he comes out at the end. Yeah. But, again, I don't fucking care. Like, <laughs> So, right. yeah, so we, we kind of wrap this thing up where, you know, Chad and Dale go to fisticuffs. Uh, Chad 
gets his hands on like a chainsaw, but not before Dale gets his hand on like a hand axe that he throws with remarkable accuracy and is able to cut Allison's ropes uh, just perfectly, allowing her to get up and escape from the log. Uh, again, I know we're we're stretching the bounds of of reality here with this entire film, but uh, I think he throws it at Chad. Chad dodges again, another duck and dodge. <laughs> the axe goes past him and then accidentally cuts the rope. Yes, and- yeah, exactly. And so they're able to get upstairs shortly thereafter. They separate from Chad, but then Chad finds out that they're upstairs in this attic. Briefly, there he goes to attack, and that's when D- Dale gets to reference the fact that once again, when they were sitting to tea. The throwaway line that Chad has of, oh, no, I can't have chamomile. I'm allergic to it or whatever the hell it is. Right. So up in this attic, what what is there, of course, but some loose leaf chamomile tea. Chad goes to attack. Uh, Dale throws the tea at his face. He goes into a quick anaphylactic shock before falling out of the window. And Dale saves Allison and the day in turn. And, uh, you know, we get a brief scene shortly thereafter where there's a bunch of news reporters that arrive to the scene and, you know, they they sort of wrap up. It's a big deal, obviously, a lot of attention called to it. And Dale goes to visit Tucker in the hospital. Tucker's kind of woozy from, you know, some morphine or whatever they gave him. But he's got two new fingers, one of which is a woman's finger, which might have been funny at a certain point in time. But I was just so over it. Didn't care at that point. And, uh, you know, he's like, ah, you know, did you did you get a date with Allison? And he's like, oh, well, no. And he's like, ah, you got to. And he's like, oh, actually, I did. We're going bowling. And then and and here's the other thing, too, man, is it's like I get I get having the girl fall in love and they kiss and everything. But sometimes sometimes it's just there's too big a discrepancy. Right. And I kind of wish that they had maybe alluded to it and they could have been friends because, like, I'm sorry, dude, that girl and Dale are never going to end up together. Call me shallow if you must. But we all know it's true. Okay. Like, so I just kind of, again, wish they would just have, like, maybe been friends or alluded to it or something like that. It's like, eh, it's never, uh, never going to happen. Uh, again, if it was played out more like a comedy, then romantic rules are off. And, and sometimes the the schmo gets the girl in comedies. But this wasn't a comedy. So because now you're trying <laughs> to believe it, uh, you know, it becomes unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, also, side note, I just didn't give a shit. Yeah, I didn't care. Same. If they That's ended really up together, to. if they ended up divorced, uh, if care. she ended up with the cabin and the divorce, I didn't care. Yep. Didn't care. Same. Same. Uh, so, yeah. So they go bowling. Uh, they kiss. The movie is over. Thankfully, because Thank holy God. shit. <laughs> and that is Tucker <laughs> and Dale versus Evil. Ryan, we're going to formalize this. But first, we are going to ascribe three adjectives that explain how we feel about this movie. What you got, buddy? Uh, this movie is vanilla and we've talked about this, uh, at length ad nauseum where it just wasn't anything. It was just in this void of genre. And, um, I didn't know what to take this as also, uh, I put, and I know this is multi-word, multi-syllabic, whatever you want to call it. Slip the clutch. I feel like this movie just kept slipping the clutch. It just kept stalling out. (laughs) It wanted to be something uh, that it was not, it wanted to give me. And so when it leaned on concept, at least in the beginning of the film, I felt like the car was turning over. Uh, and and then all of a sudden it would slip the clutch and stall out. So it it just felt like I was trying to teach a 16 year old how to drive. And, um, and it was very, very frustrating. Uh, also my last one, uh, I wish this was called the endless because I felt like this should have been called the endless and the endless should have been called Aaron and Justin versus evil. Uh, that would have all made way more sense to me. <laughs> I would have wrapped my head around this a lot differently. Uh, so yeah, vanilla slip the clutch in the endless, uh, Jason, how about you, buddy? All right. So, uh, you know, these are all sort of adjectives that I've touched on over the course of my review here today. The first one is unimaginative. Once again, just impaling after impaling, dodging after dodging. It was just one trick pony over and over and over. You know, it had that initial the initial pop from that awesome idea, that awesome setup, and then just had no idea where to go from there. The other thing is that it was lazy. I'm sorry. Like, it's just I really feel like. 
they could have, if they sat down long enough, they could have come up with some other deaths. I mean, at the very least, right? Like, you can't do four or five different impalings, dude. I don't care if you don't have right. money. Or at least, you know, find some special way, some some sort of spin to put on it, different it up a little bit, man, because come on, dude. And and so and then the third adjective I have is unfunny because, when, like we said, it's just flat out. It was not a funny movie. It didn't make me laugh. And so... Lazy, which is a, shit. Alan Tudyk is a, is a funny dude. Yeah, I he's like a good Alan actor. T- Both of them are. They should have. It, it yeah. should have worked. And 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 then again, you know the the girls in Thirty Rock. She she does well there. I mean, all these guys I have wish definitely we'd shown seen more of Tyler Labine since this. Uh, yeah. You know, I wish that he'd have made a, a a dent in the industry a little bit better. He was very lovable, and I think that he's got a place in Hollywood somewhere. Just yeah. not an Eli Craig movie. <laughs> <laughs> so unimaginative, lazy, and unfunny. Ryan, put a grade on this bitch. Dude, I'm giving this a D plus. Um, this is what this was a hard grade to give because it goes back to what you were saying about what are we grading here? Are we grading you know this versus that or just our overall experience or how does it compare in our ranks as far as like we should come up with or post some kind of chart as to how we've ranked. I'd like to see go back and see how we've ranked, what grade we've given to every movie we've reviewed so far or discussed. So that I have a basis of comparison to say is this movie better or worse than etc. Et um and so uh, is this movie better or worse than The Void? Um which I gave I think a C minus. Uh, it's I'm worse. Say yes, it's worse. It's worse <laughs> because at least the void knew what it yes, was shooting worse. for. It missed the mark, but I saw where it was headed. You know yeah. what I mean? Like I was a little on board for it, and it didn't quite nail it, but it, it at least went in a direction. This didn't couldn't pick a direction. It didn't pick a lane, and as such, I just was bored and, and taken out of it. I felt like it, it did uh, Alan Tudyk and and uh, Tyler Labine tremendous d- disservice. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, so D plus, man. Yeah, definitely. You? Yeah, no, and and I think that to your point, like this movie suffers the biggest sin that you can have as a movie, which is that it's boring, right? Movies can be slow, movies can be meditative, contemplative, etc., but they should never be boring. You should be invested in the characters. You should, you know, even if something is super slow and you're being asked to consider some sort of existential question about humanity and existence and, you know, some of those, you know, more artsy European films, etc., Right. You're not supposed to be bored, and especially in a in a damn horror film where you've got gore effects, and and then and then this is also a comedy. So again, dude, like you're supposed to have jokes for me. You're supposed to have creative deaths for me. You're in a yeah. ninety minute uh, format, so you're supposed to have a brisk pacing, and yep, absolutely failing all of that. I have to give this movie one and a half out of five stars. And, wow. and part of that is because, yeah, that's precedence because I went, I was thinking back and I gave wild strawberries one and a half stars and I was thinking okay. about it and I was like, I think if pressed, I might rather watch wild strawberries again before this film. Holy fuck. There, this kind of was the wild strawberries of its genre. Wasn't yeah. It? Like there, this does feel very much like that film. Yeah, so so it would not be fair of me to give it any higher rating than that. And once again, it's the same thing where it's like, I I don't care. I'm not invested in the character. I'm bored by what's going on. Like you've kicked me a little bit of something. Like I remember, um, you know, Wild Strawberries had that cool scene with Death towards the beginning where he's in his dreams, and so it's like you have one or two little things here and there that I can kick you. And and again, in Wild Strawberries, I did like the main performance as well. But again, it was just. And that was a 90 minute film too. And that's my thing is it's like, dude, when you're, when you've got a 90 minute film that feels longer than, you know, certain two and a half hour movies I watched recently. Like I watched an, uh, this movie called anatomy of a murder, James Stewart movie, two and a half hours long auto, auto Preminger made it fantastic dude. And that thing whizzed by, like it was, it was just over like that. And I was engaged and it zipped. And so again, you know, when you've got 90 minutes of a horror comedy and it's feeling like just the the worst longest homework I've ever been assigned. That's a problem. That's that's a huge problem. So one and a half stars for Tucker and Dale versus Evil from Jason. D plus from Ryan. Pretty much the same. Yeah, I I think this movie would have um, done well from hiring some kind of punch up writer or someone yeah. to give like a pass through and just add more humor. Uh, I think if there were more funny moments and more funny jokes, but even still in the hands of Eli Craig as the director, I don't know if he would have understood 
the the comedy timing to have added that into the editing rhythm and how he shot it, etc. So who fucking knows, man? I think there's also uh, plenty of films in this genre that have knocked it out of the park, a few of which we've talked about in this episode. So yeah. unnecessary. It's an unnecessary addition. Um, and Alan Tudyk has gone on to do some amazing things since then. So, uh, you know, he ended up OK, at least if this would have ruined his career and we never would have known who he could have been. Uh, I probably would have been pissed off uh, at this film a lot more. But, uh, you know, these guys all ended on their feet a little bit and we did OK. So moving on. Yep. Moving on. You know, they can't all be winners. And when we put this list together, this master list of films, you know, I mean, a lot of these films are films that we haven't seen before. So it's naturally going to happen that uh, not all of them are going to be winners. So that's the case here. Like you said, moving on. So anyways, guys, uh, as always, you know, we we'd love to hear from you, whether you have some feedback on any of the films we watched, whether you have some feedback on our program, whether you have some feedback on that delicious muffin that you're sitting down and enjoying right now, um, or maybe you're into crepes. Who knows? Either way, there's plenty of ways for you to get at us and give us your opinion on all those things and more. And the first is going to be on the old social medias. We are on Twitter as well as Instagram. The program is at Esoterica Cinema. We have a really nice Instagram with a bunch of quotes and pictures. And our Twitter is where you're going to go ahead and get a bunch of feedback. You can also reach out to us individually. Ryan is at the Ryan Siebold on the old Twitter and Instagram. I am at Jason Aberrant, 1B2Rs. Once again, Instagram and Twitter. And then, of course, you can send us emails. And this is where you can just go on your lengthy rants about... Once again, how much you love that delicious muffin or how much you love our wonderful show, because we know you do. That's going to be esotericacinema at gmail.com. And don't forget that you can make suggestions for films that you would like us to consider reviewing in future seasons. Obviously, we're locked in right now for our season two selection, but we are keeping a running list going of potential films to slot in for season three. So if there's something that you would like to hear our opinions on, Go ahead and send us that, and we will consider adding it to the list for Season 3. Now, on that note, Ryan, uh, I just want to let everybody know once again that when it comes to this master list that we pull our movies from, you guys all should be playing along at home. Now, we have the website live. Not super robust, but there is a lot of good information there, and there's links to all of the different platforms. There's a link to our web player, which is a really, really solid web player. So you can go ahead and listen to that at work if they're blocking your Spotify or anything like that. And uh, that's esotericacinema.com. And if you go to about the middle of the page, there will be a link there where you can download this master list for yourself, look at all of the films, so that when we play our lotteries at the end of the show, you can get excited along with us. Because, man, I always love this part. It's always it's always a good time. So without further ado, go ahead and bust out your list because we are going to select our next film. Now, Ryan, funny thing. So I was thinking about this and I realized, you know, because for anybody that's listened to all of the episodes so far this season, you know that we've gone like really genre heavy with the with the sci-fi and horror especially. And especially if you're looking at the list, you can see there's a crap ton of different movies on there. And for whatever reason, the cards have have just kept coming up with these uh, genre films, sci-fi horror. Ryan, I've been pulling all of these numbers off of Google's random number generator. And that absolutely has to be the problem because anybody who listened to season one knows that I was strictly adhering to the random.org true random number generator. And so I'm convinced that that has to be the issue. So I'm really looking forward to seeing what we pull right now. I think it's going to be a solid one. Are we going back to the random? Oh, yes. We are are officially back to the real deal. Random.org, true random number generator. All right. This is going to work for us. And you know what's funny is we have Double digits included now. Yes. We haven't actually pulled anything from the first page. Uh, The only thing we did was Dead Alive, and we actually picked that one to start the season. So we're going to go from 1 to 200. And, oh, look, we are on that first page already paying yes. off okay and ryan we have indeed got a different one i think you're going to be excited because i know for a fact this was one of your additions because i we actually called this out at the time ladies and gentlemen number 57 from our list of films is the animated classic grave of the fireflies 
Oh, wow. Okay. Now, this is going to be uh, some, so- like, heavy shit from what I understand it because everybody basically says this movie is crushing. Absolutely, Jason, from 1988. Uh, this was my edition. You were actually taken aback that I added this on. You are like, are, are you sure? But I was like, hell yeah, <laughs> I've always wanted to see this. Uh, I believe this is Japanese animation, story of Seta and Setsuko, two young Japanese siblings living in the declining days of World War II. Uh, when an American firebombing separates the two children from their parents, the two siblings must rely completely on one another while they struggle to fight for their survival. So yeah, um, you know, Bit of a, a downer on this, but I think it's going to be fantastic. The animation looks way over the top. Uh, I'm going to do a, a deeper dive on this one as well. I think there's a lot. You know, that was another one of my problems with Tucker and Dale is there just wasn't a lot to. I think I don't think that was really a good film for this podcast. Sure. Just in the sense that there wasn't really enough to dissect. I think this uh, getting back into some uh, dramas and, and uh, you know, de- uh, more uh, robust plot design and and character development and so forth. I think that's going to give us a lot more to really pick apart and uh, look for to talk about in these programs. So yeah, uh, looking forward to this one um, and uh, can't wait to discuss it with you. Absolutely. Yeah. Again, uh, this is a film that everybody who considers themselves a connoisseur, if you will, of Japanese animation and specifically with like Japanese films and Japanese animated films as opposed to uh, manga series or anime series. um, Always. This is like in that top five of just like, uh, classics, you know what I mean? Again, it's supposed to be yeah. very emotional. Yeah. And so, yeah, so it'll definitely be a different flavor than the last few genres that we've watched here. So, um, yeah, man. And it's only an hour it. and a half. Came out the so same So was Tucker and Dale, right? and it didn't feel like it. Well, that's fair. <laughs> I think this is going to be better. You know, I, I really feel good about it. Again, this is the same year that Akira came out. There were some bangers nice. that came out in 88. So uh, it all kind of falls into and to play on that. So, um, you know, that was Japanese animation as well, I believe about Neo Tokyo. So yes, uh, also on our list. It's uh, actually, I believe uh, it's uh, about number five or so on the list. All right. Cool. Cool. So anyways, so grave of the fireflies next week. Looking forward to that, Jason. Yes. And everybody, thanks a lot for hanging out with us today for this discussion of Tucker and Dale versus evil. If you did watch the film, hopefully you liked it better than we did. I mean, you know, I wouldn't wish our experience on anybody. And uh, so, but (laughs) I've also seen enough YouTube comments to know that there's a lot of people that for whatever reason seem to really enjoy the film. Either way, be sure to watch Grave of the Fireflies in advance of our next episode. And we will see you then on Esoterica Cinema. Yo. What's up, bro? Fear me, bro. Coming at you, bro. Oh shit! What's up? We're out of beer, bro! Oh shit, you know what that means! Country, Country store. store! Taking a break from the world's best nation! Me and my homie going on a vacation! Go to the woods, leave the city behind! A little bro time to go and unwind! Fresh out of beer, we need some ice cold cores! Yo, motherfucker, hit the country store! Country store's the spot where we get all our shit! The shotgun on display, let you know it's legit! Go past a lazy dog and through the swinging doors! The flicker and lights and tons of dust on the floor! Battery operated talking fishes! And up on the counter is the bobblicious! Some chicks pulled up with some mile long legs! Time to pregame with these pickled eggs! With toilet in the back, cause I need some relief! Take these audio dates of the Pelican Brief! Country stalls got no glass like Ferris Bueller! Yo, grab me a gallon of that Ecto Cooler! Get all our stuff and cash out with Cletus! Yo, his brother out back tried to show me his penis! Leave with all shit, who knows what it's worth! Yo, Cletus, his brother had some crazy. Easy girth. The scary guy out front leaves us with a warning. Gotta leave cause his brother got me so horny. We got so much shit we barely see the floors. Oh fuck, we forgot to get the ice, ice cold cores. From the visionary minds at Aberrant Literature comes a short fiction collection unlike any other. Aberrant Tales. Bursting at the seams with stories of creativity, excitement and wonder. Aberrant Tales takes the very best in modern science fiction, fantasy, and horror, and weaves them into one thrilling, eclectic package. Featuring the works of Ashton McCauley, M.T. Roberts, Daniel Curland, and Jason Peters, Aberrant Tales is available today in ebook, hardcover, and paperback versions. Online and everywhere books are sold. Published by Aberrant Literature.